If you want to find a lost city, then Indiana Jones is your man. Not only is he a swashbuckling adventurer, he's a professor of archaeology and he knows the latest tools needed for tracking down an ancient civilization. But recently I've learned that archaeologists swinging their fancy methods look a lot like this, while economists addressing the same question look a lot like this. Because it turns out if you have the right data, ancient civilizations that have been lost for millennia can be found using a surprisingly simple economic model. Our first adventure with Indiana Jones is his search for the Ark of the Covenant. This was a sacred relic for the Israelites constructed at the end of a period known as the Bronze Age. I need one of the pieces your father collected. Bronze piece about this size. But if Indy had studied economics, he would have focused on a much less sacred relic from this period, but something that would have helped him even more. These are tablets that are thousands of years old, and they contain some profound wisdom from the ancients. Listen to what this one says. I paid six and a half shekels of tin from the town of the Canishites to Timelchia. I paid two shekels of silver and two shekels of tin for the hire of a donkey from Timelchia to Hurama. All right, I tried to play it up, but they're just accounting records. And it turns out we have thousands of these from the Bronze Age. Now, they're not describing something with magical powers like we might find in the Ark of the Covenant, but as anyone who has had to sit through an accounting class can testify, Reading thousands of these is guaranteed to melt your face off. A lot of times when we read through these records, we find cities that are well known, meaning we have archaeological evidence or solid facts about where that city was. But just as often, we find cities that have been lost to time. That's when some economists came up with a clever idea. See, historians and archaeologists, they use a couple of different methods to help locate these ancient cities. For example, you might be able to find some historical record that says that a merchant had traveled from one area to another, and it was clear that they traveled north. Or maybe the things that they're trading are related to a diet that's specific to a certain region of the this area. But a group of economists looked at these records and said, if we know about these cities because of trade data, maybe we can find these cities using trade models. When we talk about trade and economics, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably comparative advantage. This is the beautiful principle that when you engage in trade, you should produce the thing that is the relatively low cost thing for you to produce, the thing that produces the greatest value. It's one of the first principles you learn in economics. So there's a trade model that's talked about much less. See, comparative advantage is about what we trade, but your comparative advantage is determined by who you trade with. That's the comparative part. You have to have someone to compare to. So what determines who we trade with? Well, the answer is gravity. I'm going to briefly cover the physics of gravity, and I want you to think about how this relates to trade. And give it a good effort. Don't just name each of the pieces, but try to think about why gravity is such a good analogy for trade. Our understanding of gravity was radically transformed by Albert Einstein, but I'm gonna use a much more basic form of gravity as written by an economist. This economist spent 30 years working for England's Royal Mint, where he managed monetary policy and cracked down on corruption. Why do we care about what an economist says about gravity? Well, that's because this economist was Isaac Newton. During Newton's much less profitable career as a scientist, he was interested in gravity. He looked at two objects that were, had a gravitational force between them and said, what if we swap this one out for something that was twice as big? How would that affect the gravitational pull? Then Newton said, how would gravity change if things were closer? And then Steven Spielberg said, what if things got much bigger and much closer? Conveniently, the gravitational force between two objects can be summarized by this equation, where the m's are the masses of the objects, and the d is the distance between those two objects. And what this says is that as the masses of the planets get larger, or as the distance between them gets smaller, the gravitational force increases. 
I'm sure you've already realized how this relates to trade. Gravity is trade. Now, of course, we're not thinking about trade between planets. We're thinking about trade between countries or in this case, cities. So what are the two factors that we think about when a city is considering who it trades with? Well, larger economies produce more and they consume more. So they're in the market to trade. So trade should go up as economies get bigger. On the other hand, economies that are far away are hard to learn about, or it costs more to bring your stuff to that economy. So as economies are farther apart, trade goes down. So the two factors are very much like the factors in gravity, where it's the size of the country or city and the distance between them. So gravity is a good analogy, but do you know what's even crazier? Remember that equation that gives us the gravitational force between two objects? Well, it turns out if you just switch the masses to the sizes of the economy, you get the exact equation you need to predict trade between two countries or two cities. The fact that this equation works when you transform the earth into money basically tells me that Isaac Newton succeeded in his alchemy. So let's say that Indiana Jones decided in graduate school to take that economics course. How would this have helped him find the lost cities? Let me show you how this works using just a whiteboard. Suppose we have a known city here. We don't know where the lost city is, but we know how much trade goes on between A and this lost city. According to the equation, the amount of trade gives us a relationship between the size of the city and how far away it is. So if the lost city is the same size as the city, it would be this far away. But that's not the only place it could be. It's just gonna be anywhere that is that distance away from city A. But if it was twice as big, it could be twice as far away. And again, it wouldn't be necessarily right there, but it would trace out all the locations that are twice as far away from city A. If we know how big the city's economy was, this equation traces out circles where it could be located. But that's not super helpful because we don't know how big the lost city was. Now let's say we had a second city, we'll call it city B, that also traded with this lost city. Again, we don't know where the lost city is, but now we know the trade flows between A and the lost city and B and the lost city. And we know that those trade flows are determined by these equations. We still don't know the size of the lost city, but if we combine these two equations, the size of the city no longer matters. What this now says is that if the known cities are the same size, then the ratio of the distances between the lost city and the two known cities is equal to the ratio of trade flows between the two cities and the lost city. That doesn't sound very helpful, but it's a lot easier to see if we just assume that all the cities are on the same line. Suppose we know the lost city is somewhere on this line between cities A and B. We also know that the trade flows to A are twice as large as they are to city B. Imagine you're Indiana Jones economist. Where on this line would you place the lost city so that the trade flows to city A were twice as big as this trade flows to city B? The gravity equation says that if trade is twice as large to A, then it must be closer to A. In fact, it must be twice as close to A as it is to be that we can now pinpoint the lost city based on the trade that's happening between these three cities. Hopefully you think this is cool so far, but also I hope that you're starting to see some problems. For example, I'm drawing out these cities on a featureless whiteboard, and that's not what the real world looks like. There are all sorts of obstacles over this terrain. And I still cannot believe how on the nose this shirt is from City B. But according to this map, it says that we should be getting to City A pretty quickly, as long as there are no mountains or large bodies of water in the way. <laughs> lakes. Why'd it have to be lakes? Those are problems for this simplified model, but if we wanted to take this seriously, we could actually take into account all of these features in a much richer model. Another problem is that cities aren't in a line, and that's okay because we can trace out a line of all the locations 
that are twice as close to A as they are to B. That's better than nothing. But it gets even better when we know of a third known city that has done trade with that lost city. Because then we can compare the trade flows to C and the lost city to the trade flows between A and L and B and L. Then using the same equations, we can trace out new lines. And where among these lines would we expect to find the lost city? Yeah, exactly, right here, where they intersect. This is so cool. Just using trade data and this super simple equation, we can define a precise region where we think this city was. And that's what these economists did. They used the trade data from these tablets to define areas where they think these cities could be. And they were able to come up with a location for all of the lost cities in the tablets. But that doesn't really mean much by itself. I mean, after all, I can just come up with some random hypothesis, point to a point on the map and say, this is where the lost city is. But how do we know that's where these cities were? That's where the economists got really clever. One of the exercises they did was pretend that some of those known cities were actually lost cities. And they said, using this data, where would the model say that these cities are located? And unsurprisingly, or maybe shockingly, if you think that this is too simple, they found the data lined up with these same locations of those known cities. So if the data and model do a good job of finding the known cities, we're going to believe that they probably did a good job of finding the lost cities. But these economists are not the first people to try and locate these lost cities. How did the economists' guesses line up with what historians and archeologists have said? Okay, before I show you how their work compares, I wanna just take a moment to highlight why I think this is important. First, there's a reason why some cities are lost and some cities are not, or why some cities continue to exist and some cities fade out. In fact, the United States is covered in ghost towns from the Wild West days where people ran out to these cities, populated them, the economy grew, and then something happened, the economy went bust, people abandoned those cities, and now we would call them lost. That is one of the reasons why this is so interesting, because if we can locate lost cities, we can look at the features of these cities and say, what about it led to these cities disappearing? That's gonna tell us something important about economic growth. But if we can use this simple model of economics to find lost cities that existed like 5,000 years ago, that tells us that there's something timeless about economics, that there's some principles that just last forever. And that tells us that we're learning something true as we study economics. And I find that beautiful. So how did these line up with what the archaeologists say? Well, it's important to understand that archaeologists aren't even in agreement on where these lost cities are located. Some of them think it's in one region, others think it's, you know, slightly far off. Now, there are times when archaeologists agree on where these are. And if we plug in the model, it turns out that the model says that lost city looks like it's right in that region. There are other times when the archaeologists disagree and the economist model says, actually, it looks like this one is right and the other one is wrong. Finally, there are cases where archaeologists believe it's in one area and economists believe it's in a completely different area. I guess we won't know for sure where the lost cities are until we get some archaeological evidence, but I at least hope that we're using this economic model to guide that work. But what I find really interesting is this shows some of the timeless characteristics about economics because economics is not just some made up thing about what's happening right now. It applies to the past. It applies all over the world, which is why you really need to watch this video about how a simple device transformed Indian markets exactly the way that economics predicted.